Hi folks, um, so let's talk about I am Andy Warhol. Before I talk directly about I am, um, so not I am Andy Warhol, I shot Andy Warhol, um, I just want to say a couple of things about the Based on a True Story label and um, the Based on a True Story um, sort of label as adaptation. And often... Um, People don't always think of the Based on a True Story as a form of adaptation, but it is, and I think I, I think it's worth um, just saying a couple of things about this. Um, there has been a, a shift in the last sort of uh, five to ten years on the Based on a True Story as a form of adaptation, and a lot of this um, has, should be credited to Thomas Leach, who has written extensively on true stories as adaptation. But the thing about the based on true stories adaptation is that they are a very um, challenging and different way of thinking about the source and also thinking about um, the secondary source as adaptation. Now, the based on a true story, you know, when a film starts, this is based on a true story, it does give a film a, like a unique status because it's sort of indicating that the source text is and is not a text, that it, it, it is based on something, um, but it's not necessarily um, a, you know, an out and out scene by scene, shot by shot adaptation on it. Certainly because sometimes the Based on a True Story doesn't actually have an accompanying um, literary source, right? So, and the thing about the Based on a True Story is it, it it carries some markers common to most sources, but not others. So what you need to do with a based on a true story is always be thinking about the wider context of it and the, the different things that are being adapted within one source. And this is very different to, say, a novel that's being adapted or a short story that's being adapted where you can actually almost exclusively just talk about the source and the finished product and sort of talk about the comparisons between the two of them. Thomas Leach, when he's talking about the Based on True Story, he says the problem is it's authorless, it's publisherless, and it's agentless, right? So it actually gets away from the whole issues around the marketing of adaptation and why it's, it actually suits the publisher and both the film to market something as an adaptation. Like if you look at the Harry Potter adaptations, there's reasons why you would market something as a Harry Potter adaptation because you know you can get that fan base. But at the same time, the film and the publicity around the film is, all, is going to bring more attention to the literary source, which is going to sell more books, right? So there's this sort of um, you know, enjoyable um, reward for both the publisher and the filmmaker. But with the Based on a True Story, it, it's it's more messy than that and it's actually not um, it's not an industrial issue as much as as the novel to film adaptation, which is also worth thinking about. Um, one way of demonstrating this is to think of the Based on a, as, on a True Story as a type of adaptation, right? And think about that as a type of adaptation. Um, it goes against the fidelity to a source, right? Only coming through plot similarities. And, and as much as we try not to talk about the similarities of one source to another, when we're talking about adaptation, we can't help ourselves but do it. And it's actually, it's a good place to start. What is different about the source to, say, the film? What changes have been made? And also, why have those changes been made? Right, but with the based on a true story, you have to actually be considering the many sources in how um, a film is constructed and how it, how it faithfully adapts. Right, so more than intertextuality, um, what we're really interested in is how the filmmaker adapts a multiple range of sources, and that's what we have to be looking at with a film like Andrew and I shot Andy Warhol what multiple sources are at work here and what multiple sources are being adapted. So how do they adapt historical figures? How do they adapt places? How do they dramatise facts and myths? What about the music? And also, and crucially, what role does casting play in this? How does an actor perform a real-life person? And in this performance they're actually adapting and they're recreating. So let's, um, let's talk about 
um, those things with uh, I Shot Andy Warhol, but just more generally on the, the whole idea around the based on a true story adaptation. So um, these are the posters from the film. Um, and I think what's interesting about both these posters, and I mean, there was a whole bunch of publicity posters that came out around the film. Um, I mean, the tagline, which appears on all of the posters, is you only get one shot at fame. All right, get it? Because she shot Andy Warhol. You know, you only get one shot at fame. And Andy Warhol was always talking about, you know, the 15 minutes of fame, that everybody gets only 15 minutes of fame. Right? And it's a matter of what you're doing with that 15 minutes of fame. Um, but what's interesting is the, the direct connections that they're, they're, they're um, sort of homaging to the Andy Warhol uh, artwork, the Andy Warhol paintings. Of course, the Campbell Soup was a very famous painting by Andy Warhol and, um, you know, the cowboy. Um, and you sort of got um, Lily Taylor. Um, in that pose, you know, her head's being sort of um, posed there. And it's kind of interesting that the way the film, just through the poses, is making this direct reference um, to Andy Warhol's art and what it's actually doing with his art and him as an artist and the way it's sort of unpacking that across the film. Um, now, with I Shot Andy Warhol, um, it's kind of... It's based on a number of sources, which uh, I'll, I'll talk about. Um, it's it's based on um, Valerie um, Polanis and her relationship with Andy Warhol. So it's it's adapting that, it's telling that story, and it's also looking at her um, Scum Manifesto. It's adapting that, but it's also pulling its story from the newspapers and it's actually looking at the historical story around this and it's dramatizing the historical story around that so unlike you know a a novel that's being adapted where you, where you can just sort of say well you know here are here is the novel here is the adaptation here are the changes with I Shot Andy Warhol to just look at the Scum Manifesto would not actually be giving you the whole story of the film because the film isn't only interested in the writing of the manifesto, it's actually interested in a number of things around the writing of the manifesto. So it is an adaptation of a number of things. It's an adaptation of the scum manifesto that um, Solanus wrote, and scum being um, society for cutting up men, right? And I'll just um, I'll just read you uh, some some of her manifesto. The manifesto is completely nuts and bonkers, um, but it's 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 just I find it riveting um, literature. I really really do, and um, it's not just a hatred towards men. It's actually an, a frustration and an anger. Well, I mean, it is a hatred towards men, but it's also frustration and anger towards women and the way that they behave around men and the way that um, they become subversive around men, subservient around men, and the way that they sort of allow men to drive the narrative, to drive the conversation. And that's what Solanus was really, really fighting against. So here is um, here's just a, a little um, excerpt from the Scum Manifesto. Life in this society being at best an utter bore and no aspect of society being at all relevant to women, there remains to civil-minded, responsible, thrill-seeking females only to overthrow the government, el eliminate the money system, institute complete automation and destroy the male sex. It is now technically possible to reproduce without the aid of males or for that matter, females, and to produce only females. We must begin immediately to do so. The male is a biological accident. The Y male gene is an incomplete X female gene. That is, has an incomplete set of chromosomes. In other words, the male is an incomplete female, a walking abortion, aborted at the gene stage. To be male is to be deficient, emotionally limited, maleness 
is a deficiency disease and males are emotional cripples. And it just goes on and on and on like that. Um, and it's really, um, it's really quite, quite bonkers, but quite fantastic um, at the same time. And really seminal um, work in, um, uh, well, certainly feminist uh, film studies and um, really sort of as a, a statement of 1960s counterculture as well. So the, the, the film is adapting that. It's actually, it's not just working her, um, her pass, you know, passages from it and using like passages as sort of dialogue from the film and having her actually reading excerpts of, of, the, of the manifesto. It, it's actually showing how this manifesto was written. So it's actually showing her on film um, actually constructing the manifesto. And this is uh, what uh, Richard Dyer would define as pastiche. And pastiche means a lot of things. I mean, pastiche works next to parody. So if you're seriously um, recreating something that's not meant for laughs, then you know it's often referred to as pastiche. But what Richard Dyer, his definition of pastiche, or one of his definitions of pastiche, is when you have a work and you have a work within the work. So if you're watching a film and, like, you know, there's a play, you know, the characters in the film are watching a play, right? The play, that's actually pastiche within the film. And with within uh, this adaptation, you've actually got Solanus writing her manifesto. So it's it's a source of adaptation, but it's also the creation of the adaptation within the work. So it is um, certainly a, a pastiche adaptation. But more than that, it's a Valerie Sol Solanus biopic. I mean, it's actually biopicking her and sort of the event around um, the shooting. It's certainly uh, an Andy Warhol biopic in that it's sort of showing him and um, working around um, sort of that moment and um, you know up to his shooting. And it's also uh, uh, about 1960s counterculture, very much so. And there's been some interesting ways of thinking about film and thinking about the relationship between Solanus and Warhol. Um, I'll just read you this quote from Dana Heller. She's a, so a professor of English, um, and she said this, the film stages the conflict between Solanus and Warhol as less the result of gender politics, particularly because Solanus intended no connection between her writing and the shooting than of the decline of print culture as represented by Solanus and the rise of new non-writing media as embodied by Warhol and the pop art movement. So what she's actually saying is within the film, Solanus is kind of representing uh, an old school form of communication, which is, you know, the, the writing and, you know, that being uh, a form of adaptation, certainly, um, with, with actually what's going on. So it, it's kind of, it's interesting to think about how you interpret this film and where is the conflict? Is the conflict actually Solanus and her head um, or is it Solanus and Warhol? Um, is it the writing and Warhol? I mean, she said that the writing and the shooting were two separate things, but the film is kind of saying that one is a symptom of the other. Um, so that's kind of interesting to think about. So when you're watching the film, um, certainly have a think about what role the, the Scum Manifesto actually plays within the telling of the story and how is that connected to the shooting. So um, as far as colonisation adaptation, Mary Harron uh, is a director I'm, I'm really interested in um, and certainly within adaptation studies, she is an important uh, contemporary figure um, and if you actually look at her filmography, she's always been interested in A, adaptation, like all of her films have been adaptations of some sort, but B, she's centrally interested in history and documenting history and recreating history and if you look at so her first um, feature was I shot Andy Warhol 
She then adapts Brett Easton Ellis' American Psycho, which is about the yuppies in the 1980s. And, um, you know, my opinion, the best and only good Brett Easton Ellis adaptation. Um, the notorious Betty Page, if you don't know, Betty Page was sort of a... a, a um, when was she set? I think the 1940s, maybe 1950s. Uh, she was a pin-up. You know, um, she was a burlesque dancer and she sort of narrates her story as well. The Moth Diaries was sort of like this vampire thing. Then, of course, Anna Nicole's story um, about Anna Nicole, the ex-playboy playmate uh, and was a somewhat socialite. And her forthcoming film is actually about... Um, the women who were arrested, who were, you know, the women who were hanging out with um, James uh, Mason um, and James Manson, sorry, not James Mason, James Manson. And when he was arrested, they were arrested with him, the three girls, and they were sentenced to execution. They didn't actually, they weren't actually executed, but they were given life imprisonment. So she's interested in those three females and she's telling their story. Um what you'll get from all of her films is a, a predominant interest in females. And, and a pre pre predominant, I mean, American Psycho is a bit different. Um, and it's kind of interesting that she would want to direct American Psycho with American Psycho being such a male centric um, film. But the other films is about women, are about women. And I think she's really interested in the females in a very male world, yeah? And with I Shot Andy Warhol, although it's a very um, androgynous world to some degree, it is a very male world. And if you look at the scenes, the way that the males dominate or the males try to dominate and the way that Valerie actually is pushing against that, and you could sort of say that is true for all of Mary Harron's films, that you have females kind of pushing against the establishment in the way that women are expected to behave and how they, you know, often um, behave, you know, through society and um, society um, mores and things like that. And Mary Harron is really interested in kind of pushing against all of that, that those ideas. So we, we do need to look at this film as adaptation as performance. So if you're looking at uh, Leach's modes, adjustment and illusion, so... Um, I think both of those modes are certainly at work when we're thinking about performance. So it adjusts, changes and alters the source without losing the sentiment. So think about, I mean, the thing about this, this work is it's not just, a, it's not just a, a, a sort of a faithful adaptation where they take all the scenes from the Scum Manifesto and recreate them. They don't even do that. They're actually about the creation of the writing of the manifesto, right? So it adds scenes. It offers dialogue to the myth around those people. So you get... You get, you know, the the Andy Warhol myth, the um, the Valerie Solanus myth, and you put them together. Now we don't know that any of this dialogue that they share actually happened, and it it didn't happen. It was it's completely made up. So they're working within this idea of of the adaptation and the idea of the tension between these two characters. So the film is constantly adjusting, right? But I, I would say that um, it's it's trying not to lose the sentiment of who these people are and the way that um, we understand them in popular culture. And through that, there's also the illusion adaptation where the film is directly alluding to other cultural contexts for these two characters. Certainly other depictions, so other films that have depicted um, Andy Warhol and also the archival footage. You know, you can you can always be looking at archival footage um, of uh, Valley Solanus and Ed Warhol, like through YouTube and things like that. So um, it, it's interesting the way that YouTube has uh, changed um, the way that we assess adaptation and the way that we think about adaptation. Um, because what we do now is when we see a film like I Shot Andy Warhol, we all jump on YouTube to see how accurate was the performance. And that's a problem, I think, in assessing performance, that it's now just about impersonation. It's not actually about acting, it's about impersonation. And um, we can talk more about that. But 
if you think about um, you know the, the central actors here, so you've got Lily Taylor, uh, Jared Harris, who you may be familiar with. Um, he was in Mad Men. He was in a show called The Royals, um, which is out very recently. I mean, he's a fantastic character actor, and he's wonderful here. And uh, Stephen Dorff, who you're probably more familiar with, and he um, he plays the drag queen Candy Darling. Um, so, you know, um, Walk of the Wild Side, the, the popular Lou Reed song, is actually about Candy Darling. Um, so think about the performance and performances as a form of adaptation and what's actually going on in this film. Um, there's, there's an interesting um, thing about copyright and this film, and I'm really interested in you know, what happens when films based on a true story adaptations can't you actually use the music of the time and the music that they're actually adapting. So with uh, this film, so Lou Reed, of course, was in The Velvet Underground, as was John Cale. Now, John Cale does the music for this film. He does the soundtrack, he does the score, and he also picked all the songs that appear in the film. But uh, his former co-band member, Lou Reed, refused for the Velvet Underground music to be in the film. Now, the Velvet Underground, if you don't know, were extremely um, popular, uh, sort of popular, but crucial to Andy Warhol. And, you know, there's the famous, you know, cover that he did of their album, you know, with the, the banana and things like that. And that they feature in the film, but they don't actually feature in the film. He, they couldn't actually say this is the Velvet Underground. So they create this sort of dummy band, which is, look just like the Velvet Underground. They sound just like the Velvet Underground, but they're not actually the Velvet Underground. Now think about that. Does this create a problem for, of authenticity in the true story when, when particular things cannot be used? Um, you know, Last Days was another one where... Um, you, you, you know, Last Days is actually the story of Kurt Cobain and his last days and um, they weren't allowed to use the music of Nirvana so they had to come up with another idea. So it's, it's really interesting, these kinds of films and the way that the, the film has to become more creative in actually what they're doing and what they're depicting. Okay, so now the Scum Manifesto itself, I think, is working, and the way it's being depicted in the film, is working within many different um, modes of leech, which is worth talking about. So you've got the celebration, which is that the heavy reluctance to change the exact words or sentiment of the source. Um, but there is something about uh, celebration. I mean, I've sort of put celebration uh, twice. Um, one is just, you know, the film saying, this is a great, mad, exciting, daring piece of writing and it should be celebrated in popular culture and why it hasn't been more widely celebrated and, you know, consider really part of that beat writing, that beat generation is, is you know, I think the film is sort of making that, that case, right? But Mary Harron, the, the director and also a co-script writer, she said, we wanted that tone, style and structure and in providing visual ideas and witty dialogue, right? So she was actually using the manifesto as a way of informing the tone and the style of the film. And I think that that is clearly, clearly there. Uh, deconstruction, you know, the text that directly asks questions about its own adaptation um, process. This film is very much a deconstruction. It's very much a film that is constantly asking itself, how do we actually adapt this, right? And you're looking at different forms of adaptation um, or deconstruction, um, pardon, across the film, where in some scenes you've actually got the character of Valerie just talking directly to the camera and just reciting excerpts um, of, of the work. And then also you've got revision, right, where revisions seek to alter the meaning and spirit of the source. And I think the thing about um, Valerie Solanus and the Scum Manifesto and popular culture, sort of certainly up to this, this film, is that Valerie was depicted as a mad woman, as the, the, you know, the ramblings of a mad, crazy woman, right? And she was never taken uh, seriously. The, the scum manifesto was never taken seriously. And I think what the film works really hard to do is give you empathy for her and to depict her as not just a crazy woman, but a symptom of a crazy society and the frustration that she feels um, you know, being in this sort of male-dominated world and, you know, feeling that, um, you know, she 
she deserves her due, like all the other people depicted in, uh, you know, in sort of the counterculture sort of Warhol um, world. So just final thought. Um, I think when we're talking about based on true story, we do have to talk about adaptation and ethics. Um, you know, what what responsibility does the adapter have when the adaptation is based on a true story? How true do they have to be to the true story? Like, for instance, in a film like Fargo, film, so that, that was my dog, in a film like Fargo, um, which opens with the intertitle based on a true story, it's not actually based on a true story at all, it's just completely fiction. You know, what responsibility do they have to actually be saying that what they're telling is or is not true story what why would they use that title card right and with a film like i shot andy walhall what does that actually mean to the true story are we watching this as documentary are we watching this as facts are we watching this as education or are we watching this as entertainment how you know literal do we have to be to the actual story right how important is the literary text? How important is the Scum Manifesto to this film and to us understanding this film? And how important is the reading of the Scum Manifesto to unpacking this film as adaptation? Right? How important are the historical figures here to the film and the way that they're being depicted? Do they challenge the way that you thought of these characters? And how do they challenge the way you thought about these characters? And just finally, how is fidelity measured in this film? Right? How do we actually measure whether this is a faithful adaptation or not? And we have to look at things like the Scum Manifesto, but also more historical and broader uh, popular context as well. All right, so I'll leave it there. Uh, I shot Andy Warhol. It's, I think it's a really, really fine film. And um, I think Mary Harron is a really, really excellent director. It's, it's, um, it's, I think it cr creates that phonetic energy of Andy Warhol, 1960s sort of counterculture and things like that. All right, uh, let's talk more about it and um, I'll see you soon.